lovely to be here, isn't it? It is. We've lovely made it through another week. Lovely to be here on Friday. Week. Sorry? We've made it through another week. I know. Just I about. know. Although, uh, I think a lot of people wake up this morning thinking, is lockdown actually coming to an end? Yeah, Because for a lot of places, it feels like that all of lockdown led to nothing, Worked it? really hard, behaved like the government yeah. asked them to. Did what they suddenly, thought. And suddenly, right. the tear allocation has come out. Yeah. And there is a lot of frustration and anger by a lot of people. Um, uh, who have found themselves still in Tier 3. Yeah, and some people in Kent, we talked about this yesterday a bit, um, and some people in Kent who were in Tier 1 went into lockdown and thought, right, do the right thing, stick with it, have come out to find they've jumped to Tier 3. I, we've got Pam here saying County Durham figures have dropped quite a lot. We are in Tier 3, we can't believe it. Uh, Liz says, and when you look at that, that map, it does look pretty stark, doesn't it? The North always comes off worst. Protect London, as always. So, certainly, those of those in Tier 3, 77% are in the North. Yeah. Midlands and the North. Grey says the North West south. shafted again. North-South divide alive and kicking. Uh, Janet says, I'm sure I speak for all Northerners placed in Tier 3 when I say that we see videos of people partying like it's 1999 on the streets of London without any visible consequences. Won't be very happy. The government beware. I'm not sure I've seen that many no. pictures of, of footage of I think the last that, time Janet. I saw that was driving back from the hospital um, on the night before lockdown came in. So that was a long you know, like time Like, people ago. were kind of, yeah, it was at the other end of it, having a, a last for hire, which was weird enough in itself. Um, we talked about the North, but, but on the front page of the Daily Mail, it expresses the feelings of people in the Kent, in Kent. I mean, there's a picturesque little village that looks like, like it's a scene out of Miss Marple. Uh, if you haven't got it, then I can hold it up. Um, and it says this village, it's Penshurst, it's got a, had a handful of cases throughout the whole thing, no deaths. Um, it was in Tier 1. It's now jumped to Tier 3. Um, and the people there are just, what on earth is going on? I mean, maybe we have Dr Amir Khan. Maybe he can help explain a little bit of this for us. Good morning. Um, good morning to morning. you. Lovely to see you. You're always a, a voice of reason and calm. Uh, we know that sort of God's in the bigger picture, and the bigger picture is uh, the fact that we want to keep people safe, we want the economy to do as well as it can and people to keep their jobs and thrive. And balancing the two is very tough. But for a lot of people, the messages are so confusing. Stick with lockdown, do the right thing, then we've got a chance of having a Christmas, meeting each other and a better time leading up to it. And for many people, that's not been the case. For the majority of the country, 55 million, uh, that's not going to be the case. And even that sort of lovely hope of five days where households can meet... Mm. Confusion was rain with that from Chris Whitty, who said, don't hug your nan. I wouldn't hug an elderly person. And it immediately made me start thinking, Dr Maria Card, well, what does that mean? What does that detail mean? Because, OK, not hugging, but in most households, you kind of got to cram together on the sofa, haven't you? And Christmas is full of getting the chair from the bedroom so you can all squeeze around the table. You know, what, what does that mean in terms of what that Christmas will look like? Hi, morning, everyone. Well, I think that what, what Chris Whitty said yesterday about not hugging reflects a lot of what people are feeling, particularly in, in the NHS. Uh, we're very nervous about this five-day Christmas period. Uh, we're, we're seeing what's happening on the front line, uh, people getting very, very ill. And, and this idea of having a break over Christmas, we understand, you know, the psychological need of the country for that. Uh, but it is it is without, you know, without doubt, it is a risky process. And, and I agree with Professor Whitty, we shouldn't be hugging vulnerable people. You, sh you shouldn't get too close, even during but the Christmas period. Car, lots Wait. of homes, there is no choice. You know, if you've got no. three households meetings or even two households meeting, you're not able to be two metres apart and sit down. You know? Well, and, the, and so the, the that's where people is... are like, what, what are we going to do? Yeah. I understand that. The reality is this isn't a normal Christmas. As much as we like it to be, it can't be a normal Christmas. The only way to get back to normality is to try and get this vaccine sorted. And going, going back to your earlier point, really, in terms of why people are angry in some places, I'm a northerner. I've lived in the north all my life. Uh, and I, I am seeing patients who, who are frustrated by the tier system. I was taking calls just yesterday from people whose jobs are at risk, whose mental health is really suffering as a result of this. And we understand why we have to uh, be, uh, restrict ourselves while we're putting to, into these restrictions. But I'll, I'll be honest with you, Kate, you know, like I say, I've, I've lived in the North all my life. All my life, I've heard we're going to be invested in the north you know we're going to be on a, on a par with the south at, at some point 
but it's never happened. And now this has been highlighted with the coronavirus. So that north-south divide is very, very real. And it, it's, it's frustrating to, to see and hear, uh, and we'll be feeling the consequences of that going into the next year as well. What I, what I struggle to, to, to understand, and I, 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 I get you, the concern within the medical mm. profession with what's going to happen with the, the households coming together over Christmas. I mean, They don't want people to go bonk. No, no, they? no, yeah. it's an hand mm. that is. But as Kate points out, when you're on top of each other for a full Christmas day, it might even be Christmas Day, Boxing Day, we've got five days, maybe people will come and stay together. Mm. A hug is so crucial, I think. I mean, everybody knows I like a hug. I'm a big fan of a hug. We know I, about your blankets. It's, exactly. It's a, it's a version of it. But I don't understand, I mean, if you've spent all day with your family and you've been on top of them, you've had lunch, you've opened presents, you're probably watching a bit of TV, sitting on the sofa, I don't understand why you can't hug someone. Surely the chances of transferring anything virus-wise has happened because you've been in the room for five hours. Why would be giving someone a hug such a big issue? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Ben. And what's important to know is that opening up for Christmas, those five days opening up households and, and allowing Christmas is not necessarily a scientific decision. It's right. more of a political decision. And so trying to balance it out with the science isn't going to work. You're right. People in households, they're going to be breathing the same air as yeah. other people within that area. So, so it, it's, a, it's a tricky balance and there is no scientific basis to it. It's more about human behaviour and social decision making. Well, I'll tell you what I worry about then is that the people that do try and observe the rules will be anxious about that and won't come together. The people that haven't been will just think, blow it. And so therefore it makes it very hard for people who are trying to stick to the rules. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I, I agree, Kate. I, I feel very strongly that, 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 you know, opening up over Christmas, having those household mixings is so, so risky. And January is going to be so difficult for the NHS February as well. Uh, and um, we're so close to getting these vaccines rolled out. It's, it's going to be, it's really frustrating to see this, really, to be honest, from a okay. purely health point of view. Uh, let's just talk about the vaccines because, of course, you know, we're getting different messages about vaccines that, as you say, they're very close. The government is asking uh, the regulator to look at various vaccines because they're excited about the potential. But there's also some, some concern over the Oxford University vaccine over their initial results. Close scrutiny of the, of the vaccine has found that uh, it was only 70% effective on average, but 90% effective on a low-dose jab also the test results that they, the, 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 the group of people that they tested, um, no one was over the age of 55, which of course it's vital that it's the, it's the vulnerable that are above 55 that are going to be protected by this jab. Yeah, it's interesting, actually. So we were all very excited about the, the Oxford vaccine earlier this week when they said that it had an up to 90% efficacy rate. But actually, uh, when the data was scrutinised by, by experts, what it found was that 3,000 people who were accidentally given half doses in the initial dose and then a full dose in the second dose four weeks later, uh, and it was them uh, that actually had a better response at 90% uh, uh, immunity compared to people who were given the full dose in both uh, injections four weeks apart. They were only found to have 62% immunity to the to the virus. So it was really interesting. And as you say, of those 3,000 people initially uh, who were given the half dose, they, they were all under 55. So that left mm. people scratching their heads a little mm. bit. Is it because younger people were given the vaccine? Is that why they had a better immune response? Uh, the MHRA, the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Agency, is now scrutinising the data. It's poring over it to see whether it meets the safety standards. Uh, and, and then after yeah. that, we'll know Which a little bit more. Which is going to be more, a risk is... in terms of trust, isn't it? But I guess one positive is, is that if, if you like, by accident, they've discovered that a low dose first and a larger dose second leads to better results, that that's great. I mean, that's the way penicillin's effectiveness was found exactly. to be. So we shouldn't fear it just because it came no. by accident. We just scrutinise should scrutinise it a little bit more, shouldn't we?